The following story contains graphic images that could be disturbing to some. Viewer discretion is advised. The kernel of the conflict in the Middle East begins with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. It is in the self-interest of, of the United States to try to be an honest broker and try to bring this conflict to an end. The question now is, what's actually going to save Israel? And what's going to promote American interests in the Middle East? And it's a different set of policies. Madam Secretary, what's the most important thing I should know about what's happening uh, between Israel, Gaza, and Hamas? It's a mess. We'll bring you the news tonight on Dan Rather Reports. Good evening. Despite two wars involving tens of thousands of American troops and a global economy in meltdown, the most immediate crisis facing the incoming Obama administration may very well be over a tiny strip of land on the Mediterranean Sea called Gaza. The latest fighting between Israel and the Palestinians seemed to come out of nowhere, but in reality, it's been building for years. This is the Gaza Strip a small piece of land wedged between Egypt and Israel. Gaza City, the capital, is one of the oldest cities in the world, dating back more than 3,000 years. The area has been the center of conflict for as long as history has been recorded. Today, the territory is ruled by Hamas, which is officially listed as a terrorist organization by the United States. And this, at least in the opinion of Israel and its allies, is what started it all. It's called the Qasem rocket. Small homemade rockets built by Hamas with Iranian help, no more than six feet long, no real guidance system, but packed with explosives. Target anywhere in Israel. Their range is less than 10 miles, but these small, inaccurate, unstable rockets are about to steer the foreign policy of the new President of the United States. This is what Barack Obama will inherit on January 20th, an international crisis on a strip of land just twice the size of Washington, D.C. Gaza is tiny, but the shots fired here were heard and seen around the world. Shooting from Gaza were the well-armed and well-trained militias of Hamas, the radical Islamic fundamentalist whose goal is the destruction of Israel. Hamas maintains a network of deep tunnels into Egypt. They allowed cameramen to videotape them bringing cattle and food through one of these tunnels, but they wouldn't let them take pictures of the missiles, heavy weapons, and ammunition they also bring in, paid for by Iran. They say Israel started this latest round of fighting. We ask Ayman de Ahmed, a Hamas activist, when they might accept a ceasefire. Depends upon Israel if they are serious in ending this crisis, in stopping uh, aggression, in stopping this kind of holocaust, this black war against civilians. The Israeli military depended on almost every weapon in its arsenal to attack what they said were Hamas strongholds. The goal was to stop Hamas from firing missiles into Israeli cities near the Gaza border. The Israeli Air Force struck first. These pictures, provided by the Israeli Defense Force, show high-explosive so-called smart bombs loaded onto American-made F-15s. The warplanes dropped them with what the Israelis say was precision accuracy on targets the Israelis say held Hamas fighters or weapons. They also dropped what you see in the center of your screen, phosphorus bombs. They rain down small, very hot sparks onto the ground. The Israelis say the sparks detonate roadside bombs planted by Hamas. Then thousands of Israeli troops swarmed into Gaza, attacking Hamas forces in hundreds of ground assaults in different villages. 
The Israeli army says its soldiers have killed several hundred Hamas fighters and destroyed many weapons, including rockets and landmines. But the collateral damage has taken the lives of hundreds more Palestinian civilians, many of them women and children. Palestinians say some 3,000 more have been wounded. Images like these, replayed often all over the Muslim world, have stirred rage at Israel and its ally, the United States. But this war has been very popular among Israelis. That's because a million civilians who live within 26 miles of Gaza have been the targets for years of Hamas rockets and mortars. We are in a situation in which we need to exercise the basic right of self-defense. We are talking today about nearly one million Israelis that are in, either in shelters or near shelters, and this is unacceptable. The rockets have destroyed homes and cars, but surprisingly, they killed a relatively small number of Israeli civilians. Still, ambulance crews in these towns are on permanent standby, and normal life has been destroyed. Israel wants the rockets to stop and wants Hamas stopped cold. The aim of the operation is a few things. First of all, to try and cripple Hamas's launching capabilities. And we're talking about thousands of rockets and mortars that targeted Israeli cities, Israeli communities, Israeli villages. The second aim is to try and decrease Hamas's ongoing motivation to carry out those terror attacks. But now, a new American president will have to deal with a 100-year-long war, a war that his predecessors and many other world leaders have tried to stop. Can Obama succeed where so many others have failed? As the fighting raged in Gaza, we asked thoughtful people on both sides what they think the new U.S. president needs to understand about the situation. Akiva Eldar, a veteran columnist for a major Israeli newspaper, said most Jews and Arabs would begin with a warning. What I would first tell the president is that there is no option of uh, sitting back and doing nothing. If uh, you don't come to the Middle East, the Middle East will come to you, will haunt you. So you better initiate something right at the beginning. Send a clear message what you're up to. Eldar, a well-known Israeli dove, has a clear message for the new administration. He says Obama can help the warring sides by at least some time by talking with Hamas. You will have to rethink the American-Israeli-European policy of boycotting the Hamas and trying to reach some kind of a, a long-term truce until both sides will be ready to go for the other option, which is a full-fledged final status agreement. Oddly, this hawkish Israeli wants to send this same message to Obama. Eora Island is a former national security advisor to Israel's prime minister and a retired major general. He now works at Israel's leading security think tank. We prefer to have an accountable government in Gaza that is responsible for the situation, that can play the role of address either for certain negotiation or for retaliation over any other scenarios where there would be a chaos and different groups will do whatever they want. And as long as there is an accountable government in Gaza, I don't care whether it is Hamas or someone else. But Island and some other hawks now think that the long-favored two-state solution is a lost cause. Now, unfortunately, I don't think that this solution is achievable, at least not in the foreseeable future. And I'm not sure that this is the only possible solution. And I hope that the new administration will make reassessment in regard to the very uh, basic premises of the problem, uh, rather than to continue to repeat uh, the same uh, announcements or the same concept that failed again and again. Many Palestinians who don't live in Gaza or support Hamas might agree that a two-state solution isn't a very good option. They just believe it's better than any other choice. George Jacobin, a professor at the Palestinian Bir Zayt University near Ramallah on the West Bank, is one of them. The kernel of the conflict in the Middle East begins uh, with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. This has been the source of other conflicts. And unless this is addressed, United States policy in the Middle East uh, will remain uh, one of uh, 
uh, generating considerable resentment, uh, not only among Arabs, but also among Muslims uh, throughout the world. And it is in the self-interest of, of the United States to try to be an honest broker and try to bring this conflict to an end. Jacobin says internal Israeli politics, like the current election campaign, force candidates to play to Israeli fears and angers instead of appealing to their hope. The reason it has uh, not been settled as a conflict is because it was left completely and totally to the domestic Israeli arena, uh, to politicians to try to outbid, outbid each other, uh, especially before elections. And it is here that uh, both uh, the United States and uh, also European countries have a responsibility, which in my opinion they have not uh, borne so far uh, adequately. Mustafa Barghouti hopes Obama will accept that responsibility. Barghouti is a moderate member of the Palestinian parliament who has been calling for an end to the Israeli occupation for many years. He thinks Obama understands his cause. I look at Barack Obama and I hear Barack Obama and I listen to the values that Barack Obama speaks about and I see his strong message of change. And I say to him, okay, here is your chance. This is a place where you can apply change, apply your values, get great respect, and most important, eliminate this horrible image of the United States in the Middle East. If the problem of Palestine is solved, there will be a very positive effect in the whole region. It will have a strong, positive vibration in the whole area. But many Palestinians believe the Israelis and the Bush administration don't want to change the situation. This war on Gaza was nothing, in my opinion, but an Israeli effort, jointly with Bush administration, to destroy the potential of Barack Obama in changing the policy in the Middle East. The people you've met up to now are all in the mainstream of Middle East politics. Now we're going to take you to the far ends of the political spectrum. Arab or Israeli, the extremists have one thing in common, an absolute unbending belief that only one side can control the Holy Land. Palestine is an Arab land, and it is uh, an Islamic land. It is a Christian land. It's a holy land. Uh, it's a land for all. And it reflects uh, all over the world. It's having reflection all over the world. Unless they solve the Palestinian issue, it means that we'll have crisis everywhere. When Hamas says crisis, it often means violence. Hamas has sent suicide bombers to kill Israeli citizens in restaurants and on buses. It also has a highly trained militia, and their fighters do more than just march and parade. With weapons and tactics imported from Iran, they spend many days training how to attack and destroy Israeli tanks and how to fight Israeli soldiers, employing classic guerrilla tactics. Israeli extremists rarely attack Palestinians. Instead, they build settlements in Palestinian areas and defy Arab militants to attack them. Rachel Saperstein, who served us soup before giving us an interview, came here from Brooklyn 40 years ago. She believes Israeli settlers are on the front lines, and she has a message for Obama. Mr. President, one thing that is so important to the safety of the United States of America is the safety of Israel. If Israel is being bombed, know that America will be punished as well. Punishment from God will come, Rachel and her husband Moshe believe, if Jews are forced out of any part of the Holy Land. The Israeli government forced them out of their Gaza settlement in 2005, and they now live here, inside Israel, just north of Gaza. The Saperstein's also believe God gave all of the Holy Land exclusively to the Jews, but they say they are willing to make what they see as a concession to Palestinians whose families have lived here for centuries. I would offer the uh, Arabs living in Judea and Samaria, or, or as known as West Bank, I would offer them the very wonderful chance, live in quietly, live with your Israeli neighbors, no country for you. You're not capable at this point in history to run any kind of a country. You can't have it. 
The extremists are a minority among Israelis and Palestinians, but they have an outsized influence on political opinion, and neither is interested in sharing the land in any kind of two-state solution. Now, up next, a controversial new voice in Washington that says you can be pro-Israel and at the same time be critical of some of Israel's actions in Gaza. Missed an edition of Dan Rather Reports? Or just want to see one again? We're now available on iTunes, so check us out. Welcome back. You've heard tonight about the situation on the ground in the Middle East, but there's little doubt that any long-term diplomatic resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian question is going to have to go through Washington, D.C. For decades, the United States has been Israel's strongest ally. Some say it's only truly loyal friend. America has given Israel billions of dollars in aid and has consistently vetoed anti-Israeli measures at the United Nations. A lot of criticism of the Jewish state is, at the very least, tinged with anti-Semitism. And the support of American politicians for Israel has been a vital balancing force. With the most recent fighting in Gaza, there were the predictable protests against Israel around the world, while in Washington, D.C., the White House and almost every member of Congress from both parties spoke out in favor of Israel's right to defend itself. This has long been the status quo, but tonight we're going to hear from a Jewish American who is trying to change the American-Israeli dynamic. He's found thousands of supporters, but critics call him naive or worse. The leadership and some of the institutions that have spoken for American Jews have, have drifted to the right, while our community is a naturally progressive center-left community. And so the leadership and the voices they've been hearing in Washington are out of touch with the base of the American Jewish community. Jeremy ben -Ami is a Washington insider who was a senior policy advisor to President Clinton. He's been in this town for 25 years, and he knows that whenever it comes to Israel, the voice from Washington is one of unequivocal support. Just last week, Congress voted unanimously to back Israel's actions in Gaza. But ben -Ami says the way we discuss the Israeli-American alliance needs to change. We're beyond the argument of, is the U.S. a friend of Israel? We need to move to a different question. Well, as the record clearly shows, uh, the United States of America the people of this country overwhelmingly have supported Israel. The view that Israel is the arsenal of democracy in a very hostile part of the world. Is it your view that this, what I will call unquestioning support of Israel has been a mistake on the part of our country? Uh, no. Uh, what I would say to people in the American Jewish community is we won that fight. America is a staunch ally of Israel. The question now is what's actually going to save Israel and what's going to promote American interests in the Middle East? And it's a different set of policies. Uh, I'm actually just, in, just between two congressmen's office right now. Now Ben Ami is trying to convince official Washington that a different set of policies, ones emphasizing diplomacy over armed conflict, should be at the top of the American agenda. Ben Ami says for years he kept hearing from Jews around the country asking why there wasn't a more prominent voice addressing their desire for more diplomacy in Israel. So eventually, Ben Ami quit his day job as a political consultant to take up the cause himself. Last April, he founded an organization he called J Street. Well, tell me how J Street got its name. Well, the uh, grid of Washington, D.C. has uh, all the letters running from A to W, but there's no J. And so our analogy is that we are filling a void in the political map of Washington, D.C. He designed J Street to be an effective Washington player, part lobbying group, part political action committee. The lobby uh, works with Congress and works publicly uh, to promote uh, policies and, and positions that promote Israel's security that are 
promoting peace in the Middle East. Uh, and the Political Action Committee, independently of that, uh, supports candidates and endorses them and, and raises money for them who are willing to stand up and take those pro-Israel, pro-peace positions. And what is the mission of J Street? Uh, number one is to change the dynamics of American politics when it comes to Israel and the Middle East, to allow a more open space for uh, policy making and for policy debate. When it comes to lobbying for Israel in Washington, this sleek office building is the epicenter. It's home to APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. They're a must stop for presidential candidates and are considered the second most influential lobbying group in Washington after the NRA, the National Rifle Association. APAC has a reputation for pushing a conservative agenda, but still has the ear of liberal politicians. It has more than 100,000 regular donating members, an endowment of over $100 million, and offices in 18 U.S. cities. We wanted to hear APEC's view of J Street, but our request for an interview was declined. Now, many Americans are familiar with APEC. APEC's been around for a long while. Uh, for those who know about it, I think it's fair to say that they believe it is the pro-Israeli, American, but pro-Israeli operation for representing Israel's interest in Congress and elsewhere. Yes, and APAC's done a terrific job uh, over 30 years. In fact, I think they've created the uh, manual that uh, lobbyists and uh, folks who want to have an impact in Washington should read and study. Um, I think they do speak for a large number of the American Jews in this country on a wide range of issues. Uh, in our view, we are not setting J Street up to be in any way anti-APEC or an alternative to APEC. We believe that the agenda of peace uh, and an agreement and a, and a diplomatic settlement, a diplomatic resolution to all of these conflicts that have blown up yet again in the last two weeks, that is the only route to really secure Israel's long-term interests. And we feel nobody has actively promoted that sufficiently and has created the space for policymakers here to promote that. That's what J Street's about. It's not anti or pro any one organization. We have an agenda and a way of getting it done. Well, we're going to see Halverson on Thursday, so I don't feel as... Uh, let's definitely do Shingri. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you again. Yeah, thanks. Oh, is there a price? There's a price op-ed? Let's keep walking. Huh? We're in the uh, halls of the Longworth House office building, and today is the day that the new members of Congress are getting sworn in for the 111th Congress. And they're all having open houses. They're having their constituents and friends and supporters come by to congratulate them. And it's our chance to say hello and say congratulations to the people that our, our independent PAC supported in the last cycle. A new political season is coming into focus on Capitol Hill. And a lot has changed since the last time Congress convened. Democrats now have a solid majority in both chambers. A new president is about to be sworn in and Israel is fighting in Gaza. We have time. Yeah, okay. we have time to do one more. I mean, look, Chiefs of Staff right. are, what, 28, 29? So. Education, yeah. Israel, you know, we've got to be able to... Ben Ami has his pitch ready for the members of the new Congress. As we have learned in Iraq and we've learned in other wars and conflicts, you can't necessarily defeat a political challenge and a, and a movement uh, through military means. And so the congressmen are, and women are trying to understand how should we talk about this to both show our support for Israel but express the, the nuance and the complexity of the moment. And we're trying to help with that. What, what is the exit strategy if you decapitate Hamas? There's been a tradition in the Congress which has been very uh, supportive of Israel, and I share that position. California Representative Lois Capps is one of the 41 candidates endorsed by J Street in the last election. 33 of them won their seats in Congress. In order to support Israel, we also want to support the Palestinians. And that's where there may be somewhat of a parting of the ways. Um, to support the Palestinians humanitarily, and uh, in their right to be a state in a two-state solution for the conflicts in the region is not universally shared uh, in, in uh, uh, the Congress, and perhaps I would also say that in the country. So the positions that J Street has taken with respect to a two-state solution, I, am, I embrace because that's something I share. J Street's impressive arrival on the Jewish American political scene captured some attention in the press. The Forward, a respected independent Jewish newspaper named Jeremy Ben-Ami, one of the five most influential Jews of 2008. 
I think that the uh, launch of this new lobbying spokesperson uh, was greeted a little skeptically by people. Jane Eisner is the editor of The Forward. She says J Street's growth and influence was not a foregone conclusion. I think that it was some question about whether or not it was actually going to be catching the mood of the American Jewish community. And it did. I think it did. Why do you think it did? Well, I think that there was an appetite for a broader conversation about Israel. Um, I also think that J Street represents a different kind of lobbying, or at least tries to, which is more grassroots you know, fresher and newer, catching a wave that we saw with the Obama campaign and with a lot of other political efforts in the last couple of years. Uh, even the name is like a little cheeky, you know, I, and I think that appeals to people. All told, J Street's political action arm, its PAC, raised more than $2 million in 2008, most of that in small increments online. But that was before the recent fighting in Israel when the stakes of J Street's appeal for peace were lower. Immediately after this latest Gaza conflict ignited, J Street sent a mass email to the 100,000 people on its email list. The J Street statement read in part, quote, Neither Israelis nor Palestinians have a monopoly on right or wrong. While there is nothing right in raining rockets on Israeli families or dispatching suicide bombers, There is nothing right in punishing a million and a half already suffering Gazans for the actions of the extremists among them. That comment led to a torrent of criticism, even from former supporters of J Street. Eisner's paper, The Forward, ran a scathing op-ed piece written by a prominent liberal rabbi in response to the J Street email. Well, we took very serious issue with uh, the rabbi's comments and... uh, for, for us, it's actually quite shocking. There are two peoples here, and both peoples have suffered. And for the rabbi that leads the reform movement of this country to not be able to acknowledge that and then to say it is morally deficient to try to acknowledge that, we were shocked by that. In his op-ed, the rabbi called J Street's comments, quote, morally deficient, profoundly out of touch with Jewish sentiment, and also appallingly naive. It was somewhat surprising that he chose to write something, uh, you know, as powerful and as critical of this, and in particular in naming uh, J Street in the piece. Well, first of all, he said he'd supported J Street when it was formed and had thought well of them, but that he really was highly critical of them for Mm -hmm. what he called a version of striking moral equivalency Mm -hmm with Mm -hmm. Hamas and the elements Mm -hmm. in Gaza been rocketing and the Israeli attack. I think by any uh, reasonable analysis, it was harsh criticism Well, it it was. It was. And I think it it honed in on a particular part of the J Street statement uh, initially that that did appear to create this equivalency. And, you know, that's very troubling for many people. All of us should be pained to the bone that hundreds of people, apparently many civilians, have died so far in this war. Um, But we also have to recognize that um, for eight years, the people in southern Israel were terrorized. Did many of them die? No. But that doesn't, you know, terror doesn't need to have actual death to, to do its dirty business. Hamas was terrorizing a population for a very, very long time. And I, I think, you know, it, one could argue that the central role of any government is to protect its citizens. And so there's a very strong argument to be made there that that's what Israel was trying to do. It's a cold Sunday morning, and thousands of people turn out in front of the Israeli consulate in New York in a show of solidarity with the Jewish homeland. This demonstration is being sponsored by dozens of Jewish groups, representing a wide range of constituencies. The message is that Israel is in a time of need and that it has the unflinching support of the United States. If the Arabs are so concerned about the Palestinians, they should make an effort to help them. They send off purposely rocket fire from kindergartens and schools and hospitals, endangering their own people. They're doing, these are, Hamas is like a Nazis to their own people. It's like, it's horrendous, they don't value life. Hamas is like a culture of death. 
look, when it comes to Israel, you know, the Jewish community in America is like, it's like the, you know, your family. So you complain about each other all the time with each other or on the phone with your sister-in-law. But then if someone is somehow attacking your family, you rally round. And I think that there's this kind of always been this tension in the Jewish community in America when it comes to Israel, uh, whether it's the Israeli government's policies or other things going on there, um, to try to both be supportive, but also to be, you know, a loving critic. And th that, you know, tension has folks feeling that they can't really criticize uh, the government in the same way in which, frankly, we know there's an incredibly lively debate in Israel all the time about the government's policies. Who's ever in power? You've said that the right wing of the Jewish American community has, and I use your word, hijacked the debate about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and controls what it means to be pro-Israel. Can you give me a few examples of this hijacking and, and control? The uh, way in which a policy argument and a debate over what's actually best suddenly becomes a name-calling exercise where you are anti-Israel or anti-Semitic, you know, which I've been called many times now in the past few days in particular, uh, that's not a rational debate. And so by creating that atmosphere in which people are afraid to actually speak their minds, to talk rationally, that, to me, is hijacking the debate. When this program is over and people say to me, which I expect some will, Dan, rather you talk to this guy with J Street. He seems reasonable, he seems intelligent, he certainly seems a supporter of Israel, but he doesn't understand that with Hamas and Hezbollah, that to negotiate with these kind of stone coal pillars is a dead end street and extremely dangerous for Israel. What am I to say to them? Well, I think that it requires a bit of uh, nuance and sophistication to actually deal with this complex situation. Number one, there are deep, deep threats to the U.S. and to Israel that come from nuclear weapons, that come from bioterror, that come from groups like al-Qaeda, that come from and are stated by the leadership of countries like Iran or movements uh, like Hezbollah. So those are threats and they need to be addressed. The question is what's the best way to address them? And if you engage in a set of policies that deepen the hatred, that escalate the violence? Do you play into the hands of the Al-Qaeda's, of the Iran's, of the Hezbollah's, and give the people the perception that that's the best choice, the people that live in the refugee camps and have not seen a political path forward? Wouldn't we be draining the swamps of terrorism if we actually followed a political path by creating the alternative that the people there will choose? And we have to give them a hope of a future and we have to give them a political way to achieve what they want, which is their independence and their freedom. Debate about the future of the Palestinians is common and wide-ranging in Israel. It's this kind of discussion Ben Ami would like to see happening in this country. Well, anybody who's been to Israel, as I have any number of times, knows Israelis criticize their own government regularly. Oh, absolutely. The debate there is far broader than the debate here, and I find it as I said, with my family at the dinner table, I find it in the halls of the Knesset. We find it in the newspapers, in the media of Israel. The debate there is broad and robust, and we should be able to have a similar discussion and debate here in the United States, particularly about what American policy should be, because we have a right as Americans to debate American policy. Whether you find ben Ami's rhetoric compelling or dangerous likely depends on how you view the terms of the Israel-American alliance. The fact that organizations like Hamas and Hezbollah engage in brutal terrorism and advocate for Israel's total destruction is not in dispute. Nor is Israel's right as a sovereign nation to defend itself and its citizens. The question is one that is as old as human conflict. What should be the balance between force and diplomacy? When we come back, we'll discuss this with a diplomat who has also advocated for us, former U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. My conversation with Madeleine Albright when we return. <music> 
And now, a conversation with a decision maker. Madeleine Albright was Secretary of State under President Clinton. She was the first woman to hold the job in our nation's history. Now out of office for a few years, she has some very frank opinions about her successors in the Bush administration and what it will take to end the fighting in the latest conflict in the Middle East. Madeleine Albright has been advising President-elect Obama, but she emphasized that she speaks only for herself and not the incoming administration. I spoke with her before a live audience at the 92nd Street Y here in New York. Well, given today's headlines and what have been the headlines for the last few days, if President Obama were here tonight and he would say to you, uh, Madam Secretary, what's the most important thing I should know about what's happening uh, between Israel, Gaza, and Hamas, what would you tell him? It's a mess. Um, I, I think I would, you know, I think that the issues that are out there for him to deal with are incredibly complicated, and I outline them in my book, and I do talk about what the Middle East uh, process that he would have to pick up, uh, he or anyone when I wrote the book, uh, what the process was, and that it was an ongoing issue in terms of how the United States that has had a historic uh, relationship with Israel uh, how we would continue to deal with Israel's national security interests, which are similar to ours, and then also try to deal with how a process that I think had not been um, very active in the last years needed to be activated. And I've said, to, I've said this to people, is that the Bush administration had a roadmap, but they really didn't take it out of the glove compartment until recently, and I had been saying that for contextual reasons that it was very important for the U.S. to be more actively involved. And what I think we've seen, and we're seeing this in, in the situation now, is Hamas has gotten more powerful, Iran has gotten more powerful, and the United States has been absent to a great extent. And so that is the context in which uh, the next president has to look at how to deal with Israel's national security interests and how to have a much more active role uh, in the peace process. Do you agree or disagree with the theory that Israel uh, made this move now, clearly a move they felt they had to make during the transition period before President Obama comes into office? in order to give him the cleanest slate possible. Do you agree or disagree with that? Well, I think there are different theories about this. And, and again, if I might reiterate what you said, I'm speaking for myself here as a, uh, an analyst, and I'm not speaking for the Obama administration. But I do think that, first of all, there were real issues going on um, in terms of the number of rockets that were being fired into, from Gaza into Israel. There also are Israeli political issues going on. There will be an election in February. Um, and there has been generally a question as to whether Israel needed to show that its deterrence works, because there was some question after the Lebanon uh, incursion as to whether the credibility was an issue. So I think there are a number of aspects of this, but the transition period both in Israel and to some extent here, I think, has played a role, but the immediate issue here has been the firing of rockets um, into Israel. And what about the theory, which is not held by everyone, but I've heard said, that the Bush administration favored this, may even have encouraged it, uh, with a feeling that they'd like to go out uh, showing that they are very strong for Israel uh, and that they were actively engaged in trying to make things better. I have to say, Dan, I have been um, perplexed for eight years about uh, what the theories of the Bush administration have been on issues. So I can't read their mind on this. But I, I do not think, I mean, what is interesting as you come to the end of one's term, and I, that's happened to me, is you do think about what you've done right and what you've done wrong. and. Um, and I think that there is undoubtedly some sense that there was going to be the hope that the Middle East process would be a good legacy issue. I don't think it's turned out that way, but I think it is very hard to kind of read their mind, I have to say. I gave that up. But I ask you, if, if President-elect Obama were here, what would you say to him? Uh, 
if you, if you were the Secretary of State and the Israeli Prime Minister called you a few weeks ago to talk about the impending attack on Gaza, what would you have advised him? I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I do think that the, one of the issues here is that um, I, I think that it's sometimes very important for there to be conversations among heads of state or secretaries of state um, in terms of trying to be helpful. I think there are always questions, and there were in a number of issues, for instance, just to look at a different area in the Balkans when we were in office, whether green lights or yellow lights or red lights were given. Uh, but I, I do think that diplomacy is a very important part of uh, the national security toolbox. Um, and I think that it's important for conversations to be able to take place uh, in terms of allies talking with each other. You're not only um, a maker of history, you're a close student of history. Is there any American president since Franklin Delano Roosevelt coming into office for a first term with more confounding challenges than President-elect Obama? I, I honestly think it is as hard as anything that I have ever seen, and maybe even more complicated than what Franklin Roosevelt faced. Uh, clearly, the economic situation is a very complicated one. In my book, and if I might say this, I said that the next president would, deal, would have to deal with what I call five big umbrella issues. How to fight terrorism without creating more terrorists, um, I happen to disagree with the term war on terror. The people who attacked us on 9-11 or attacked in Madrid or London or in Mumbai are murderers. Uh, and if you talk about a war on terror, we are giving them a more mythical status as warriors. They're murderers, plain murderers. Uh, and we have to figure out some way not to create more of them. The second big issue is how to deal with the broken nuclear nonproliferation system. There is a loophole in it in terms of the peaceful uses, and you can't tell uh, how, or it seems to be easier to get to weaponize than we thought, and, and the system is broken. The third big issue is, I think, how to return the good name of democracy. I believe in democracy, and I think we're all the same, and people want to make decisions about their own lives, and President Bush said that Iraq was going to be a model for democracy. Now, maybe someday Iraq will be a stable democratic country, but I don't know any leader who looks at Iraq now and says, I want my country to look just like that. So we have to restore the good name of democracy. The, um, fourth, the fourth big issue is how to deal with the negative aspects of globalization. Um, and for me, the biggest one is the growing gap between the rich and the poor in this country and abroad. And while there's no direct line between uh, poverty and terrorism, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to know that if you're alienated that you're more likely to sign up with the other side. And then that nexus of issues of energy, environment, and rising food prices. Now, I didn't have the global financial crisis in there, which I think in many ways is something that obviously President Obama is going to have to deal with first. And then there are two hot wars and their unintended consequences, Iraq, and the unintended consequence is, I think Iran has done the best out of Iraq. And then there's Afghanistan and the problems in Pakistan. Pakistan has everything that gives you an international migraine. It has nuclear weapons, poverty, extremism, corruption, um, and a weak government, and is in a very uh, delicate location. And then we have problems in Darfur, Congo. Uh, there are changes in Latin America. Um, and there's just this huge uh, agenda, and I don't think I've ever seen anything like this. And President Roosevelt actually did not have this whole um, international agenda that is out there at this stage. It was mostly financial at that time. We're getting back to um, Israel, Gaza, and Hamas. Should the United States change its policy toward Hamas? Um, I personally, again, I'm the one that let me just explain something. There were state sponsors of terrorism. There was a list of that. And then when we were in office, we did, in fact, create a list of terrorist organizations. Um, and I was the first one that, that 
was imp or created that list. It was very complicated to do, and the Justice Department was very involved in it, and Hamas was on the list. And I think that um, so long as it is a terrorist organization, it is, um, it is the law of the United States that we do not deal with them. Um, I think that there was a big mistake made, and, um, and this has to do with what, how Hamas came to power. As I said, I believe in democracy, but um, I think if you're going to have elections and people participate in elections, one of the things you have to give up is terror as a weapon. Um, and one of the reasons that we were able to move forward with some changes in Northern Ireland, for instance, was that the IRA split and Sinn Féin became the political body that eschewed terrorism. And I think the U.S. made a mistake in terms of pushing for the elections at the time, thinking that Hamas would not win, uh, and because it, there was no entry fee for entering into that. I think that other countries clearly deal with Hamas, and um, Egypt, I think, is one of the countries that is now trying to have some kind of a role in working towards um, a ceasefire or some kind of settlement. I want to get back to uh, President-elect Obama for a moment. Uh, he's been keeping quiet about Gaza uh, because he says President Bush should be the only one to speak on behalf of the United States. Another version, we only have one president at a time. Uh, but uh, President-elect Obama has commented that, and I quote here directly, the loss of civilian life in Gaza and Israel is a source of deep concern for me. Now, we both know how every word spoken by any leader about the Middle East is dissected beyond recognition. In this case, even the mention of concern for lives in Gaza has been interpreted by some as a departure from the Bush administration policies, especially in this case where Gaza was mentioned before Israel. Uh, one observer in Israel told me, seems like everyone here got Obama's message loud and clear, wrap up soon before the new guy takes over, unquote. I'm, I'm not sure that I could do that kind of an exegesis uh, <laughs> Talmudic of uh, the, that language. But I do think that what, first of all, I think he's been very serious about the one president at a time. Um, I also do think that he is concerned about the humanitarian aspects. I think if you listen to the discussion, I, I don't know anybody that isn't concerned generally about loss of life. I think that he's also was, and he, he said this in this statement, that he will be ready on day one. Um, and that I think that would indicate that this is going to be a very high priority issue. Um, and would have been under any circumstances. I think uh, there had been a lot of discussion during the campaign about the fact that there had not been a very active American role uh, discussions about the need for um, um, an envoy or a peace team or some way that it would indicate that the United States was going to be involved more actively and criticism of the fact that the Bush administration had not been. Your opinion, Madam Secretary, is reoccupying Gaza the only way Israel can destroy Hamas? I, I uh, think that it that is a very hard question. I don't know the answer to it, frankly. I think that it is untenable uh, for people to be subjected to rocket attacks. I, I think it is an untenable situation. I also do think that it is very difficult. Um, I've been to Gaza um, in a variety of times. Obviously, not since I have not been there actually since I left office, but. Um, I think that it is very, and, and Aspen, for instance, also, we were trying to develop jobs in Gaza at a certain point, because I think that people in Gaza have to be able to make a living. And some of that also has to do with um, calling for openings um, of the various border crossings and an ability to have some kind of an economic relationship. And the real problem here has been is that um, Hamas is an organization that practices terrorism, and it makes it very difficult uh, in order to have kind of a normal relationship. I have so many questions to ask you about the Middle East in general 
and uh, about how foreign policy works, how it really works as opposed to how we may think it works. But before leaving the subject, at this moment, what do you think is the single most important thing for Americans to know and understand about what's happening uh, with Israel, Gaza, and Hamas? I think that, um, first of all, I think it has to do with generally what people need to know is happening in terms of America's role and what this election was about. And it has to do with something that I said earlier about the expectations. Um, there is a sense that this election has been um, really historic in terms of the change of how America will be viewed and what America's role in the world generally will be. And so I think the thing that people have to focus on is uh, where will America use its influence? Uh, what can it do to bring peace to various parts of the world and use the good, I have always believed in the goodness of American power. Um, but it isn't always just military power. It is the concept that we uh, have very good diplomats, that we have the capability of putting ideas forward. And I think that the thing that's most important for people to know is that we are going to be engaged actively uh, and that we are going to have a very smart president. And to someone who might very well say, listen, I know the Middle East, uh, that the, the relationship of Israel and its neighbors is very important. And I recognize, this is all in quotation marks, and I recognize the seriousness of what's happening with Israel, Gaza, and Hamas at the moment. But we've got a country that's going through an economic meltdown, part of a global economic meltdown, we have two hot wars ourselves, as you described them, in Afghanistan and Iraq. And a president, no matter how bright, no matter how hardworking he is, there are only so many hours in the day, so many minutes in the hour. And that there's an argument that goes along the lines of, listen, the Israelis and their neighbors are going to be having trouble in my great-grandchildren's time. And we need to concentrate on what's important. And I want the president to focus hard down on the economy. To that line of thought, you would say what? Well, I, I personally disagree with that. I mean, I, what is interesting is that I have always believed in the importance of American engagement internationally and that America really can play a positive role. And it was interesting because one of the things during the 90s, which um, I was telling you earlier, I was teaching today, and. Um, I, all of a sudden, I looked at my students. I was talking about the 90s, and I thought, my God, most of them were two years old. And uh, I might as well have been talking about George Washington. But, but basically, we had a different issue at that point, And it was the end of the Cold War. Uh, and there was kind of the thought that there would be a peace dividend and that we could concentrate on ourselves. And President Clinton and I felt very strongly that the U.S. needed to be engaged, which is where the term indispensable nation came from. He was the first one to use the term, but I right. used it so often that it became identified with me. And what it really meant was not that um, we would do everything alone. There's nothing in the definition of indispensable that's alone, but that we would be engaged and that American power uh, and American influence and American uh, uh, dealing partnership with other countries was essential. I feel that way now for a different reason, not because there's a peace dividend, but because the world is a mess. Uh, and our role in it is very important. I do think we do have a president who actually can multitask. Um, and he has also put together a stunning national security team, a really great one. And what does happen, and, and I, I was talking about transition, I have been transitioned into, and I have done the transitioning. The latter is much more fun. But what you do in this particular period is have endless meetings and try to set out the priorities and figure out what the president's agenda is and what the agenda of the Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense is. Um, and I do think that he has put together a team that not only uh, where he can focus uh, a great deal on the, on the economic situation, but it is global. Uh, 
And I think the important part is to realize that whatever solutions are in the United States also have uh, to be dealt with internationally, and that he has a great Secretary of State uh, who is also going to be able to deal with this issue. Former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. Her new book is entitled Memo to the President. And that's our program for tonight. With the notation that we still have very much in mind U.S. and Allied troops fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq, and that we'll have stories about them on future programs. For HDNet, from New York, Dan Rather reporting. Good night. If you would like to add your name to an email list for information on upcoming programs, or if you would just like to send a question or comment, please email us at viewer at hd.net. A network of deep tunnels into Egypt. They allowed cameramen to videotape them bringing cattle and food through one of these tunnels, but they wouldn't let them take pictures of the missiles, heavy weapons, and ammunition they also bring in, paid for by Iran. They say Israel started this latest round of fighting. We ask Ayman de Ahmed, a Hamas activist, when they might accept a ceasefire. Depends upon Israel. If they are serious in ending this crisis, in stopping uh, aggression, in stopping this kind of holocaust, this black war against civilians. The Israeli military depended on almost every weapon in its arsenal to attack what they said were Hamas strongholds. The goal was to stop Hamas from firing missiles into Israeli cities near the Gaza border. The Israeli Air Force struck first. These pictures, provided by the Israeli Defense Force, show high-explosive so-called smart bombs loaded onto American-made F-15s. The warplanes dropped them with what the Israelis say was precision accuracy on targets the Israelis say held Hamas fighters or weapons. They also dropped what you see in the center of your screen, phosphorus bombs. They rain down small, very hot sparks onto the ground. The Israelis say the sparks detonate roadside bombs planted by Hamas. Then thousands of Israeli troops swarmed into Gaza, attacking Hamas forces in hundreds of ground assaults in different villages. The Israeli army says its soldiers have killed several hundred Hamas fighters and destroyed many weapons, including rockets and landmines. But the collateral damage has taken the lives of hundreds more Palestinian civilians many of them women and children. Palestinians say some 3,000 more have been wounded. Images like these, replayed often all over the Muslim world, have stirred rage at Israel and its ally, the United States. But this war has been very popular among Israelis. That's because... Good evening. Despite two wars involving tens of thousands of American troops and a global economy in meltdown, the most immediate crisis facing the incoming Obama administration may very well be over a tiny strip of land on the Mediterranean Sea called Gaza. The latest fighting between Israel and the Palestinians seemed to come out of nowhere, but in reality, it's been building for years. This is the Gaza Strip a small piece of land wedged between Egypt and Israel. Gaza City, the capital, is one of the oldest cities in the world, dating back more than 3,000 years. The area has been the center of conflict for as long as history has been recorded. Today, the territory is ruled by Hamas, which is officially listed as a terrorist organization by the United States. And this, at least in the opinion of Israel and its allies, is what started it all. It's called
The following story contains graphic images that could be disturbing to some. Viewer discretion is advised. The kernel of the conflict in the Middle East begins with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. It is in the self-interest of, of the United States to try to be an honest broker and try to bring this conflict to an end. The question now is, what's actually going to save Israel? And what's going to promote American interests in the Middle East? And it's a different set of policies. Madam Secretary, what's the most important thing I should know about what's happening uh, between Israel, Gaza, and Hamas? It's a mess. We'll bring you the news tonight on Dan Rather Reports. the Qasem rocket, small homemade rockets built by Hamas with Iranian help, no more than six feet long, no real guidance system, but packed with explosives. Target anywhere in Israel. Their range is less than 10 miles, but these small, inaccurate, unstable rockets are about to steer the foreign policy of the new President of the United States. This is what Barack Obama will inherit on January 20th, an international crisis on a strip of land just twice the size of Washington, D.C. Gaza is tiny, but the shots fired here were heard and seen around the world. Shooting from Gaza were the well-armed and well-trained militias of Hamas, the radical Islamic fundamentalist whose goal is the destruction of Israel. Hamas maintains 